Good tidings, all you beautiful individuals. Welcome to another Epi of League Unlocked. Eric and Mark here with you, a beauties to recap the last two quarterfinals that we didn't get to over the weekend. And thankfully, not only was Riot saying thank you to T1, but probably the collective entire, both Korean and just esports in general fan base avoiding disaster we don't have four lpl teams in the semifinals. t1 not only shows up but they show up to absolutely annihilate and obliterate lng in 3-0 fashion 19 neutral objectives out of 20 captured by t1 uh, room for improvement yeah, well, that improvement is going to be necessary against a squad like JDG because that is the next task up ahead for T1 after a 3-0 dismantling over LNG. One of the teams that a lot of people, ourselves included, had in a top three type of consideration for this event, what their power level could be, how they could contend. And it was nothing compared to the might of Zeus in the top lane, making sure he's landing every single one of those Jace shots on the enemy team. I mean, this whole series, I feel like the camera couldn't even keep up with every lane annihilating for T1. You got, you would go from owner and faker out playing a 2v2 to Zeus is getting a solo kill. And listen, it wasn't just that ga Jace game. The Aatrox performance out of him too, this was, this was best top laner in the world level Zeus we were getting. And this was an Aatrox that was 0, zero, zero for so much of this game, but still had that presence. You knew that that Aatrox was going to come down and he was going to rule the day when he gets his opportunity. 1v9 at the end, essentially making sure that it is T1 coming out on top. Crucial plays from him. He stepped up major in this series, really rounding into that type of form, that potential that we talk about him. As you already mentioned, owner, faker, making that play, that jungle mid was in really tip-top shape. And that's all before we get down to the master class in the bottom lane put out by Guma and Kyria. They said, we are the best bot lane at this event. We've got that confidence. You want a little bit of a sample? Here you go. And they gave us three different combinations to be treated to. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, we'll get into all five members because everyone stepped up on this T1 lineup, but how many times over the months, years, are we talking about T1's drafts saying, what the hell are they doing? Why would they do this? Why did they let this through? This was a masterclass of pick ban, especially having that Senna pivot. I think busting out the Nyla, even LNG was, oh, whoops. We, we were not prepared for that. And Kyria just bringing back these 80 carry supports to kind of say all these engage melee supports. Let me break the meta one more time. He breaks the meta again and provides that doubt in your mind when you're going up against T1, when you're preparing, when you're in that very tense moment of draft where you have to consider the type of possibilities, what is available, what they can do to break your composition or what your goals are. A bottom lane that is able to bust out that Nyla and Senna, as you mentioned, that type of duo, which we can talk a little bit more about later, the little specifics in there of why that's extra nasty. Then you throw in the Varus Ash and you top it off with the extra little meta sprinkle of everything going on with Renata, which right now, think of this event, kiria has got to be the best Renata that we have seen out there on the Rift. T1's bottom lane, knocking it out of the park. Almost every time this guy plays Renata, there's at least one, usually two ultis out of him that are completely game or team fight changing he had a couple um in this series but yeah i mean across the board what a level up from t1 mark can you imagine this is the same team that was losing back-to-back -back series against drx a few months ago uh -oh. Well, let me tell you, this ain't the Poby experience, my man. We are on the Faker experience with the rest of this T1 lineup. Everybody pumping on all cylinders. And this is the T1 that we saw throughout the majority of the year. What you saw last year, this team that was runner up so many times. This also is that same squad with that hunger to try and be the champions this time. And I think that effort, that full domination against LNG, that's that first glimpse of the type of T1 monster that is awaiting everybody else remaining at the event. And listen, anytime there is such a dominant 3-0 in one fashion in a quarterfinals, there's also an underperformance. And there's no question 
Scout MVP of the regular season in the LPL. One of the best Swiss stage mid laners that we had. Didn't have it on the day. Didn't have it going up against his former mentor in Faker and Tarzan as well. These are two guys we were talking about in top 10 players at the event status. They weren't top 50 at the event in this series. Completely neutralized, completely gapped by their counterparts on the side of T1 in the mid lane. You know, I don't think he ever didn't really do anything bad, didn't really make any egregious mistakes type of things, but there was never that positive change, that swing of momentum coming through from the gameplay from Scout, something you would have needed in this series. And then even looking more so at Tarzan, the way that he was just put in his place, just not able to do anything because of what owner wanted to set in the jungle. That is absolutely one of those things you can look at for the underperformance on the side of LNG. And even, you know, again, someone with maybe not the expectations that would have been the same or the same type of resume, but you can look at Zika in the top lane and say that this is maybe the one underperformance, the one disappointing result that we have seen from him at an event where he really did rise up to the challenge of everything else that we've seen from this international competition. And the jungle matchup, no player on you know an actual contending team has received more slander this year than owner on team one a, a few months ago a few weeks ago even people are already talking about who's gonna replace him next year well the t1 season is still going on so it's gotta be cathartic and refreshing to see him absolutely silence all these haters yeah, and I think it's, it's he obviously struggles just from what happens being a jungler and the type of attention that you're going to get and the requirements or desires from the di all the different angles of where someone is coming and approaching a situation and looking at it, especially the negative situation at times for T1 with owner. You're looking at what he does right, what he can propel this team towards. Players like Faker, like Kyria, have talked about him being a key aspect of the playmaking, of being the creativity for T1. I think you saw in this series, he was really uh, getting it going with the rest of the team. Every, every time they panned to him on the map, he was just in the right place at the right time, whether it was initiating a gank, counter ganking, stealing a blue buff from Tarzan at level three, killing him and getting away with it. He was just immaculate movement around the map. And I know, obviously, the hometown Busan crowd, very happy to see T1. They were cheering anything from a shock blast to killing a dragon. They were thrilled that it was not turned into a library. And uh, now it's, we really got it. And we always are appreciating Faker. But listen, most of the time, a career event is making semifinals at Worlds for most players. You say, wow, especially a Western team. You say, that that's our Worlds. Winning Worlds is making semifinals. Eight for eight. Faker has semifinals is his worst performance at Worlds. That is a ludicrous stat among an ocean of insane stats for Faker. I, I don't think I've been blessed enough in, in my lifetime, you know, watching either traditional sports, esports, whatever it is, to see a dominant player continue to provide those examples, those historic records time after time of why they are the very pinnacle of what it means to be a player at this sport. Faker, right there, as you said, that type of success, that type of history to establish for yourself. There's nobody, nobody else is doing what the unkillable Demon King is doing for T1. And there's no better demonstration of T1 having their mojo than a slight smirk out of Faker after a 3-0. A slight smirk for him is the equivalent of you and I jumping on a table pumping our chest. So, <laughs> yeah, Pretty much from, from the reserved likes of, of Faker. It was great that they had him out doing the interview with Gumayushi because they knew that, okay, we're going to get Faker. Probably pretty standard answers, pretty respectful ones coming through from him. And yes, even with that little bit of a smile, but you got to bring Guma out for a little bit of the extra trash talk. And after that performance from him and Kyria, he's already be talking, be talking some trash too. I don't care if it's Ruler and JDG on the other side. I mean, a little side dish of revenge for Guma against Gala as well from that 2022 RNG you saw in that uh, teaser video turning Busan into a library. Ah, it was a, it was a pretty loud crowd. Uh, I think you'd be getting kicked out of the library if everyone was being that loud. So we're very excited. T1 already smashing some viewership numbers for LNG. It's definitely going to go to the moon matching up against JDG 
in the semifinals. But before we get to previewing that incredibly hype matchup, we gotta, you know, give our eulogy for KT Rolster. And I want to highlight, because people were so doom and gloom about the LCK and seeing the LPL potentially be all four semifinalists, the LCK wasn't really that bad at this event. You see KT eliminated D+, Civil War, Gen.G, Game 5 against BLG. That's really the only disappointing one you talk about because KT was incredibly competitive against JDG. And if not for one pretty bad mistake, we're talking about a Game 5 against them. Gen G is a disappointment because of obviously a little bit of past history, of course, with those results and still then the added on top of it of, well, back to back to back champions not able to get it done. Yes, tough competition with BLG, tough series, all these type of things. You still can slice it as that disappointment. But you look at KT and I don't know how anyone, I mean, there can be some angles of it, but you still got to be looking at the positives. And that positive is game one, that big punch right out of the gate. It's coming from KT. They're taking that one and they are taking it with the team fights against a squad like JDG with something crazy. And yes, that crazy, it didn't last because game two, you had JDG plugging everything in. They're online, they're ready, and they put out that full force. And from that point on, you knew that this series was going to be a real deal. You got to step up to the plate and beat a JDG that is online, hungry, and ready to try and get to the next round. And unfortunately for KT, that was too much for them to handle. I mean, that first game, I don't think you've seen anyone beat JDG like that. If you removed the uh, name tags, you would have thought that's JDG beating up on KT and been like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, check, looks about right. Uh, but I mean, game four, they have like a 5 6k gold lead. If BDD isn't kind of walking into a shockwave, getting blown up, letting Ruler and Knight do a little 2v4 action, we're going to a game five. You're still obviously assuming JDG probably takes a game five but anything happens there so even though kt loses you should be happy with the performance kt had having far and away the most difficult journey at this world's and i and i love him i want dagda nowhere close to a kt rollster broadcast ever again can't be talking game five early no 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 can't be talking early can't be talking excited just as he does it a split minute later you're getting that barren moment. You're getting Knight and Ruler making it game over. Oh my goodness, what a thing. But yeah, we could have been at that game five so close. And again, not disappointed whatsoever with them. And they showed that JDG can bleed and we'll be doing, you know, full preview uh, stuff for T1 matching up against JDG. But I, I guarantee you T1 is looking at some of the film uh, from this series and saying, well, okay, we definitely had KT's number this year, and let's see what they're doing to beat up on JDG taking some notes. And I'm sure JDG is seeing what happened in the LNG series against T1, and they're kind of going, uh-oh, uh-oh, the real deal T1 has arrived at the event, the real deal unkillable Demon King. He's coming for that title. And again, it's just... History repeating itself. Gen G beats up on T1, has their number all year long, but we get to the international events and who is always the last LCK team we're talking about? Of course it's Faker, of course it's T1. Gotta love it. Gotta love having T1 here at these type of moments. And as everybody has of course talked about having them as that one Korean, that one LCK option in the sea of the LPL that remains at this event provides that little bit of a difference, that little bit of spice and uniqueness that changes things up. And if you told me before at the beginning of this event that we would get JDG versus T1 on the line, best of five, I don't care that it's semifinals. Dial it up and give me it. And listen, I know JDG beat T1 at MSI, but remember that was maybe the most contested series of that tournament that T1 was giving JDG everything they could handle in an incredibly close back and forth five game set. Yeah, I think a lot of people have forgotten about how that one went down. And I think a lot of people are overlooking just what type of momentum you can build at an event like this one. And then, you know, I know that there's going to be that time in between the last series and that kind of stalls things a little bit more than if you were a T1 side that you would like to given the performance. You're still going to be carrying that in. You're still carrying in the way that the meta has evolved at the event and the way the meta is going to evolve during that five-game series is something I'm looking at. And T1 talked about it. 
and why they took out LNG. There's no more looking at any other teams and going, oh, maybe that's something interesting in the meta. Maybe we should be trying this. It's not our comfort zone, but maybe we should try that. They are confident in their read of the meta and their picks. They want to prioritize and use. And I got the faith that T1's got it cracked down. And then, again, one last wrap-up the rest of the LCK. Despite exiting in the same spot, Genji and KT, different expectations coming into this event, different roads to get there. You're feeling great about KT's run as a whole, and obviously people are flaming Gen G left, right, and center. Probably a little bit too much, but a disappointing end for Gen G. You're proud of KT. Yeah, that's got to be the way that you're slicing it up. I think you look at the performance from KT Rolster, you look at the whole year from this organization, from the team rebounding, and you got to be looking at and saying to yourself, I'm happy with this. Maybe if they got a different draw, the luck works out, they can find another way through and continue at this event. Not the way it works this year. You hit it again next year. If you're on the Gen G side, you're asking a lot of questions. You're asking, where is this performance? Why is this the drop off? Why can we not continue this back to back to back championship level of success when we get to these international events? It's going to be back to, back to the drawing board for a lot of LCK squads because there's so many free agents heading into next year. And we've already been getting some free agents slash in writing verbal agreements in the LCS over the weekend. It looks like we got a former MVP jungler returning to the LCS. I think you and I were both a little flabbergasted that Inspired wasn't playing in the summer split, kind of expected him to be going back to EU, but now your boys from Sheep Esports saying he's linked to FlyQuest and the new look squad for 2024. Oh my lord, we are making some changes over here in the LCS. And yes, those changes, of course, get started while most of the Eastern regions are still involved at Worlds. But these changes of Inspired coming in for FlyQuest replacing Spica. In the jungle, that is going to be quite a change, quite a shift up for this FlyQuest squad. I think there is other talkings about bringing in their Academy ADC as well up to the main roster. Going to be a different year for this FlyQuest team. And we already saw FlyQuest was linked to Jojo Pion, kind of bidding between uh, Golden Guardians and obviously Cloud9. So I've heard multiple people be saying FlyQuest are looking to spend this offseason in a year where we're going into esports winter and no one else is looking to spend. I don't know where FlyQuest is getting this influx of cash, especially after such a disappointing 2023. Uh, whoever it is behind the scenes making the conversations, I want to know what are your talking points to get people on board with this one. Because yes, after what was a year where you did make a splurge, make a splash, go all in. And I don't think you got anywhere close to the type of return that you were hoping for or expected with both either, you know, uh, take your pick or both of them, a Vikla and Prince. This FlyQuest team is trying it again. And I think a little bit safer, at least, with someone proven in the LCS and proven to provide that MVP type of difference of uh, in the jungle is going to be inspired. And yes, you could have said, well, you still had Spica and everything else. I think there was a lot of issues with a lot of things going on with Spica with FlyQuest where we never really saw the fully focused, fully committed version of Speaker that we have seen in the past. There's no arguments for me that he is one of the players with the top level of potential available in the LCS. Now the results are going to tell you a different story after this past year. So that is going to be where Speaker is going to have to push up against it and change the narrative. And obviously that becomes the next question is where Speaker going to end up. We know Closer is becoming a free agent, so probably the number one link squad is going to 100 Thieves, assuming Doublelift is still going to be there, get those two boys reunited. And if Spika's out for FlyQuest, we know Prince Vikla already gone. That makes me think they're doing a hard reset, five new players. Vulcan's already been linked to Cloud9 returning, which means to me, the secret sauce, if you're Cloud9, you say, we're getting Vulcan. Berserker sounds like he's coming. Jojo, Blabber, you know what would fit perfectly in that top lane? Another reunion. Bring on Big Daddy Impact. You get another Korean player alongside Berserker, and you kind of need a weak side top laner if you got JoJo and Berserker, and there is none better in the LCS than Impact. Normally, I'd caution this because I'd say, well, you're already reuniting with one of your exes in, in Vulcan. You're bringing in a second ex in this situation. That's not going to work out well. 
But if there's anybody with the right attitude in that type of situation, it would be Mr. Grandpa Impact in the top side coming over. Of course, Mr. Green Card and a resident in that top side. And as you mentioned, being able to play the weak side option when you do will have a roster that is going to have the threats like a Jojo Pian, like a Berserker in the bottom lane. Yes, you're going to be in that type of territory in the top side. And I don't think, again, I'm, I'm fairly certain that playing that specific type of requirement or that type of style is going to be better suited to someone like Impact than it would be for someone Fudge who's already on that roster. And listen, then you're reuniting three-fifths of that EG roster with Vulcan, JoJo, and Impact. And I know we miss the excitement, the hype that was Danny as a domestic star to be. Hate to bring that up because it's a terrible story. But Berserker can hold his own down there in the bot lane on his own, own right. So if... I mean, this is my dream Cloud9 roster. It sounds like we already got four-fifths of this getting close to confirm. But if that's the squad heading into 2024 for Cloud9, not only is that going to be a fan favorite, which Cloud9 already is, but, I mean, across the board, domestic talent, and then you bring in Berserker, Impact is a little bit in between. That's looking like a perfect ingredient list to me. Turn back the clock, look back at what was going on with EG when they had JoJo Pion and Danny and things were popping off and we're all excited. That is that mid lane bot threat duo that you dream about, those type of lethality that they offer and the way that they would work together to support it up and make the other one even better. That is the secret sauce that you want if you are Cloud9 because that is the one that puts you over the tippity top of everybody else. And then we can all start huffing that hopium copium again when we get to this time next year. That's why they do the offseason news so quickly. You forget how the LCS was at Worlds and we immediately repeat uh, the cycle and you say, oh yeah, but next year? Before you get any chance to formulate that critical thought or anything else, you're right back into the loop. That's how they get you, and you know what? They're going to get me too, guys, I'm sure. Surely Cloud9 wouldn't get 3-0'd by this version of T1. I don't know. No, no, not no. when they matched up. Definitely <laughs> not. Uh, lots more off-season stuff obviously going to be happening, but that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with your beauties. Thanks for watching, as always.